Men are good. I'm glad you're here today. We're going to talk about something interesting. The four things that make the world of men and boys different from the world of women and girls. You know, we've been through 50 years of this BS crap about, you know, the first biggest lie of the 20th century was that women in the United States were oppressed. You know, we've done plenty of videos on showing how that was a bunch of BS. But there's another lie, too, the second biggest, and maybe the biggest, who knows, you can debate on that. But the uh, other lie is that all of our sex differences are due to socialization. Or at least the primary amount of sex differences are due to socialization. Just the way we were socialized. And if only we can socialize boys in a different way, they will be more like the girls and the world will be a better place. Have you heard that before? <laughs> I bet you have. That is some crazy stuff. That is really some crazy stuff. And we're going to talk today about the four things that prove that that is crazy. The four things are testosterone, the male hierarchy, precarious manhood, and moral typecasting. We're going to take those one at a time. So the first up is testosterone. Now, testosterone, just having more testosterone shows that we live in different worlds. I mean, boys and men have 10 to 20 times the amount of testosterone as the women and girls. And guess what that does? You know, for years they thought this testosterone stuff was all about violence and aggression and, oh, it's going to make men this terrible violent guy and blah, 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 blah. And now with more refined research capacity, they're finding that, wait a minute, it's not about violence and it's not about aggression. It's about striving for status. Striving for status. That's what testosterone does. It pushes boys and men to try and be better, to try and get things done, to try and look like they're independent, to try and get as much status as they can. You know, work for more money or more fame or more education, maybe not today, uh, more power, more real estate, fancier car, taller. I mean, all of these things raise status up and up and up. So boys and men live in a world where they're pushed to strive for status. That creates a very different world than the world of women and girls where they don't have to strive for status in the same way. Ah, yeah, yeah, but testosterone has a lot of other things too. You know, along with striving for status, testosterone lowers fear. So it brings the men's and boys' fear down a notch, maybe two notches. And at the same time, it increases their willingness to take risks. Now, I want you to think about that. You've got someone who's going for a CEO job, and they're willing to take bigger risks, and their fear level is lower. Don't you think they'd be more likely to get the job? Yeah, I would think so. If they have a good IQ. But guess what? If they don't have a good IQ, what happens? It's called Darwin Awards. You know, if you mix lower IQ with a greater willingness to take risks and a lowering of fear, I think that tells us the story pretty much about why more men get the Darwin Award than women. And if those of you who don't know about the Darwin Award, it's these terrible awards they give to people who sometimes die in the process of doing something really stupid. And that's low IQ along with higher risk, higher testosterone, and lower fear. But it does more than that. You know, the, the uh, testosterone has the uh, capacity to lower our stress. It pulls the stress down. You know, think about Edison, you know. He tried, strive for status, strive for status, strive for status. And it gave him this resiliency to keep pushing. Because it, it also, it brings what they call stress resilience. It, it, it cuts back on the stress. Fascinating. Then the last thing it does... Ay, ay, ay. Threat vigilance. Threat vigilance. Which means, okay, once you've gotten a certain amount of status, you better defend it if somebody challenges it. That's what testosterone does. It pushes men to defend that status if someone challenges you. Hmm. 
Think bar fights. Think low IQ and bar fights. Guess what happens? They're striving for status, striving for status, trying for status. Someone else says, you don't have any status. Oh, yes, I do. Oh, no, you don't. Kaboom! So again, you've got this threat vigilance along with the lowering of fear, raising of risk, striving for status. It creates all sorts of things, both good and bad, but a lot of good that people don't really know about. And think about it. Just having these things going on at a much greater rate than in women and girls, don't you think that changes the world of boys and men? But have you ever heard anyone say anything about that? About how because boys and men get these higher doses of testosterone, their world has changed? Hmm, I'll bet you haven't. And you haven't heard much about the other four either. Okay, so the first one's testosterone. What's the second one? The second reason is the male hierarchy. Hmm, the male hierarchy. I mean, why is testosterone pushing men and boys to strive for status? Strive for status, strive for status, because that's what they need to move up in this male hierarchy. Starts to make sense when you think about the male hierarchy. And let's talk about that a little bit. You know, in nature, um, most mammals and some other animals uh, have the sexes. The two sexes are divided into two camps. One camp is called the competitors, and one camp is called the choosers. Now, usually, it's the, the choosers are the ones who spend more time with childbirth, with taking care of children, with actually giving birth, and things like that. And the competitors are the ones who compete to try and get the choosers to choose them as a mate. All right? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's really fascinating. They found that among the choosers and competitors in all these animal populations, there are some very important differences between these two groups. The choosers are different from the competitors. The competitors are larger, they're more competitive, they're more violent, and they have shorter lifespans. Hmm. So generally, throughout the nature, you know, it's the competitors who are bigger, stronger, are, are a shorter lifespan, more competitive, more violent. Why? Why are they like that? What possible reason could they have for being larger and stronger and more competitive, etc.? Because that's what they need in order to get the girl. They need to have those things in order to get the curl. You know, take an example. The um, um, bighorn sheep. Oh, man, the bighorn sheep. You know, what do they do? The males run and boom, they butt heads. And they back off again and boom, they do it again. And they keep on doing this until one backs down. And the one who doesn't back down is the winner. And as they keep going and going, competing, competing, the final winner has the best access to the top-rated bighorn sheep females. Hmm. Same idea with the bowerbirds. The bowerbirds, the, uh, the males, for the first, I think it's five, six, seven years of their lives, they practice making these bowers. These bowers are these beautiful uh, things they make out of twigs and, and junk and trash and whatever. They, they make these beautiful bowers. And why do they do this? Why do they spend so much time making those bowers? Because the female chooses who she's going to mate with based on who makes the best bower. So the males get real serious about this bower stuff. And in fact, they'll go and sabotage other males' bowers in order to make sure they choose him as the mate, right? And sure enough, if they choose him, they choose his bower, bingo. They have sex in the spot, and that's that. So in both these instances, both the bighorn sheep and the bowerbirds, the males have to strive for some sort of status, right? And they use that status then to get access to the females. Now, what's really interesting is this is not always the way it is. Sometimes the competitors are the females, not the males. I think seahorse um, population and, and uh, some birds, it's the females that strive for status and they compete in order to get the guy because he does more with childbirth and childcare and things like that. And guess what? In those populations, the female birds and, 
And seahorses are larger, they're more competitive, they're more violent, and they have a shorter lifespan. So it's not just this striving for status stuff that makes a difference. It's not just your sex that makes a difference. It's whether you're a competitor or a chooser. Hmm. And men, as we can see from the testosterone piece, are pushed to strive for status in order to get closer and closer to the top where they can, like the bighorn sheep, they can can get the girl, right? Of course. I mean, it's fairly simple. I can remember when I was a little guy, you know, how would we choose sides as boys? Man, as boys, we'd choose sides that we'd all line, get in a big circle, and, and the two best guys would choose sides. And they'd choose the best guy they could for the first choice and the second choice, the next best, and the next best, and the next best. And in that process, guess what happens? You know, the boys start to understand where they are in that hierarchy. Well, I can remember when I was a little guy, I was never really good at sports, but I wasn't terrible. But I was hoping all the time, please not last. Please don't choose me last. Please don't choose me last. And I don't think I ever got chosen last, but that fear was there. I did not want to be chosen last. I knew there was something bad about being at the end of the hierarchy. But, you know, I never saw my daughter choose sides to play house. Hmm... So we're different. Men and boys are in this hierarchical thing, you know, the, in order to get married. You know, the human populations, the way we strive for status and the way we compete is more complicated than the animals. You know, the animals, it's pretty clear. One is a chooser and one's the competitor. But both sexes actually compete with humans. The, the uh, women compete by what? By trying to be as attractive as they possibly can. That's their main way of competing with each other. And they work hard at that. I mean, the cosmetics industry is a $64 billion industry. $64 billion. Compare that to $32 billion, which is the NBA, the NFL, and the MLB all combined. Just $32 billion. So cosmetics is, is... really up there. So the women compete by trying to be as attractive as they can. The men compete by striving for as much status as they can get. Because the higher your status is, the higher you're going to go in this hierarchy thing. And the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more likely you're going to get the girl, right? So men learn to strive for status. It's part of what we do. But guess what's happened here in the last 50 years? Those men who strive for status are now being shamed. Because striving for status, competing all the time, is seen as toxic. Something's wrong with you. You compete all the time. It's like some sheep psychologist goes to the bighorn sheep males, the young males, and says, Boys, don't butt heads. Don't butt heads. We don't want you butting heads. Butting heads is toxic. That would confuse those sheep, don't you think? Just like our boys these days are being confused by the mental health profession, telling them that they shouldn't be striving for status so hard. And what's really bizarre is that when girls strive for status, when girls try and compete, 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 and go higher and higher, they call that empowerment. Huh? We're living in a crazy place, man. Okay. So, you know, the... um. Testosterone is the fuel. It starts things off. And then the hierarchy comes along. And men are slotted then in this hierarchy based on how they compete and how they do. And the better they do, the more likely they're going to get the girl. The worse they do, the less likely. Now, can you start to see how men and boys are living in a different world than women and girls? They've got this juice that tells them to strive for status. Then they live in this status-driven spot where they've got to keep on trying and trying and trying in order to get the girl, right? Then they're told there's something wrong with you for doing that. And let's go to number three. So we've seen how boys and men have more testosterone, which pushes them to strive for status. We've seen how they have to live in this hierarchical world where they have to compete, basically, for uh, reproductive access. But there's a third thing that is important that you rarely hear about, and it's something called precarious manhood. Now, 
what the heck is precarious manhood? Scientists have started a study in the last 10 or 15 years, gone all over the world looking at what happens when boys become men. And guess what they found? They're not considered men until they prove it. Hmm. That's a little odd because guess what? Girls, when they're, you know, have their period, they're considered women from then on. Now, don't you think that is kind of a living in a different world for boys to have to prove their manhood and girls never have to prove a thing? Hmm. It's one to think about. So this research is fascinating. A man named Vandello has been at the vanguard of all of this, and he's done some fantastic work looking at how men are pushed, basically by our culture, uh, to prove they're men. What a bizarre concept. But the first thing Vandello says is that manhood must be earned. You have to earn it. It's not something that um, is just given to you. He says, like, the female, the women, the status is ascribed. It's something that just comes with the, the uh, maturity. You know, once women go through puberty, they're considered women, right? Men and boys, not so much. In fact, they, they found that you have to prove it all the time. You have to keep proving that you're a man over and over and over again. And the second thing Vandello found was that, guess what? It can be lost, you work hard to prove that you're a man and you can lose this at any time. And the loss is potent. I mean, you know, you go down in the hierarchy, of course, if you if you lose this status, if you lose this manhood status thing. So men live in a world where they know that A, they have to prove that they're men and B, it could be gone in a moment's notice. I don't think women have much of a concept about what it's like to live in a world like that. Because they don't have to prove they're women. Very different from the man's situation. The third thing Vandela talks about is that proving your manhood has to be a public act. You have to prove it through what you do in public. Huh. So have you ever seen men proving their men in public, right? They get out there and prove their men, and the women are kind of rolling their eyes going, what is that? Why can't he just let that go? Well, between threat vigilance and between having to prove in public that you're actually a man, uh, we can see now why men are more likely to push that hard and to prove that they're men. You know, because this is a big drop in status if he goes down in this precarious manhood judging thing. Now, what does precarious manhood do? What does it do? It's the slotting mechanism. It slots the male hierarchy. It shows who's at the top Who's at the middle and who's at the bottom? Think about it. Everything a man does slots him in this male hierarchy with precarious manhood. His job. You know, what people always say, well, what do you do for a living? And they listen real carefully and he says, uh, I, I um, clean dishes at McDonald's. <laughs> what does that tell you? Zzz, boom. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a doctor. Really? Can you feel the difference in those two things? Yes, you can. Because see, that's the whole slotting mechanism. That puts him in a whole hierarchy thing about where he is. Sports in general. Sports is what? Sports is a slotting mechanism for winners and losers. You know, winners and losers, the whole thing, a man's life. I mean, men love sports and they love the whole hierarchy thing in sports where, you know, you, you look at these statistics, right? And it tells you who's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way down. Business is the same way. And sports and business are huge slotting mechanisms to show, show where men are. And why do they do this? Why is precarious manhood the way it is? Why do men compete for ladies? To make it easy for the women to choose the right guy. Hmm, what are the men trying to prove? The men in precarious manhood are trying to prove, A, they have agency. That means they're able to go out there and get things done. B, they're trying to prove that they're independent. You know, an independent man is one who tells everyone else what to do, and no one tells him what to do, right? That's a man highly independent. So men will work hard to make it so that as few people as possible tell him what to do. And he'll make it so that, you know, you don't see it when other men tell him what to do or other people tell him what to do, right? Because, see, that drops him down in this whole precarious manhood. It drops him down in the hierarchy and it drops him down in status. 
So men live in this world of status. You know, they have to. They have to. But unfortunately, guess what's happened? Now, this whole world of status has been turned into something that the psychologists call toxic. The feminists call it toxic. Oh, men striving for status. Oh, men being slotted and wanting to win, wanting to come up on top all the time. You know, he's toxic. He wants to win all the time. He's toxic. Can you see how crazy that is? Men are in this naturally in this world through their biology, through the culture all around the world telling them they have to prove their manhood and trying to be as high in that hierarchy as he possibly can. And now, instead of getting admiration and respect, he gets shame and he gets called toxic. And now the very last one. It's called moral typecasting. Moral typecasting. What the heck is that? Before I tell you what it is, let me tell you a story. You know, when I was working in therapy with with men and women who were traumatized for well over 30 years, I'd see men and women who'd been through some horrendous stuff, you know, plane crashes, house fires, deaths of children, all kinds of horrible things. Sometimes I'd work with both the man and the woman, the husband and the wife, who'd experienced some sort of big trauma. And it became very clear after a while that the woman's pain and the man's pain were treated very differently by the people in their communities. Generally, people would run towards the woman and say, Oh, how are you? Tell us how you're feeling today. How is it different from how you felt yesterday? You know, what can we do for you? Can we bring you this? La, 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 la. Tell us your story again, right? But the man, if he was lucky, he'd have someone come up to him and and say, How's your wife doing? (laughs) It's like they weren't really asking him about his pain. They were asking about his wife. No one wanted to touch it. So I, I coined this phrase, and the phrase goes something like this. A man's pain is taboo, and a woman's pain is a call to action, because that's exactly what it seemed like. It seemed like when people saw women were in pain, they were called to action. They wanted to do something to help. And when a man was in pain, they wanted to just scurry away. Hmm. So it just made me wonder about what the heck is going on here, because it didn't add up. It didn't make any sense. And along comes Kurt Gray. I guess it was maybe 10 years ago. And he starts studying what they call moral typecasting. Moral typecasting. Now, what the heck is that? What Gray found was that they would, um, people automatically and instinctively will see a moral situation in a dyadic pair. So there's a pair going on in this moral situation where one is what he called the agentic type. Now, the agentic type is the one who does the good or evil to the other person. That's the person who can take action, right? Then there's what they call the patiency. The patiency is the one who has something done to them. And Gray looked at this and he said, and you know, not only that, but these two are mutually exclusive. So the people who are seen to have patiency are rarely seen to have agency. And the people who have agency are rarely seen to have patience. Okay. And Gray went a step farther, and he looked at how people responded to each. And the agency types, people thought, well, they need less support. They don't need so much support, you know, these agency types. And they saw this agency type as being more blameworthy. Mm. And they saw them as deserving punishment. You know, when they did something wrong, they saw this group, this agentic group, as deserving punishment. Right? Oh, boy. Now, the patiency group was completely different. The patiency group, people were seen as victims. They were seen as needing support. And they got compassion and understanding. People assumed this patience group was in greater pain and that they were more worthy of help and they would garner more help in the process. Wow. So remember, these two are mutually exclusive. So one is patience. One is agency. One gets all the support. The other doesn't get very much at all. Well, that's the beginning of moral typecasting. But then recently along comes another researcher by the name of Tanya Reynolds. And Reynolds asks an important question. She says, well, is there a gender component in this moral typecasting thing? (laughs) 
ding, 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 ding. Oh, yes, there is. Reynolds studied, she, I think she did six or seven studies looking at whether there was a gender component in moral typecasting. And what did Reynolds find? She found that, hmm, people will assume that women have patience. And people will assume that men have agency. Now, what does that translate to? That translates to exactly what I saw when I was doing therapy. That the women are going to be a call to action. People are going to focus on their pain. Oh, she needs more support. Poor dear. And the men are going to be seen as not needing support at all. In fact, if they did something, the finger will be shaken at them. Two very different things. And here's something else Reynolds found was that, remember, it's mutually exclusive. And Reynolds found that when the woman, who most people assume has patience, does something wrong, right? She's the perpetrator of evil. Guess what? They automatically assume. <laughs> they automatically assume that she deserves understanding and support. So the patience rubs off even when she is the perpetrator. And I think it's easy to see that the reverse is also true. When the men are the victims, they're not seen as having patience. They're seen as not needing support. You know, we can see that all over. So what does this do? This creates a scenario where boys and men are living in a different world than girls and women. Why? Because boys and men do not get immediate support for their troubles. They don't get a lot of people running to aid them when they're in trouble. Whereas girls are more likely to get that kind of support. So this moral typecasting thing plays out in all sorts of areas, including men's issues. I, I, I think about suicide. You know, four times as many men commit suicide each year in the United States as women. No one seems to care. And the moral typecasting thing starts to make some sense of that because it says that people simply don't care about men, their emotions, their needs. They're seen as agentic. They can take care of themselves. Oh boy. Then there's domestic violence. You know, this whole moral typecasting thing made it so simple for feminism to portray domestic violence as only the women are hurt and these men these bad men hurt these poor, defenseless women. Can you see how the moral typecasting thing plays into that? People automatically see the woman as the victim and the man as the perpetrator, even though we know now it's about 50-50, right? But it's easier to push the idea of women being victims and men being perpetrators, and men end up getting no help at all. And think about it. Our legislators have the same difficulties. <laughs> they're victims of moral typecasting too. And so they don't think men need anything. Men are agentic. They can take care of themselves. But the women, they're tied to the tracks. We better help them. You know? Workplace deaths is another thing. You know, the, the, how many men, 93% of deaths in the workplace are men. No one cares. Now we know a little bit more about why that is. You know, this stuff is not just on a macro level. The moral typecasting stuff is on the personal level, too. I mean, think about it. How many times have you listened to a man and his emotions in the last six months? Just listened to hear without judgment. Probably not so many. Warren Farrell talks about, uh, what does he say? Women want a man who's in touch with his feelings. But Warren says, well, actually, what they mean is, Women want a man who's in touch with her feelings because she doesn't want to hear about his feelings. I mean, we see this all the time in therapy. You know, the <laughs> therapists are not so interested in men's issues. They're interested in the women and taking care of the women. So it plays out all over the place. This moral typecasting thing definitely plays out in many areas, but most importantly, it plays out in changing the world of boys and men into something different from the world of girls and women. Now, let's sum this thing up a little bit. We've talked a lot about these four different things. And testosterone. Ladies, I have a question for you. What would it be like if you had stuff in your veins which was pushing you to strive for status and to win all the time? I'll bet you wouldn't like that so much. But guess what? That's what happens with the men. 
Yeah, and how about the hierarchy? How would you like it, ladies, if if all of a sudden you were judged as not being a woman because you weren't modest enough? Or maybe you're judged as not being a woman because you didn't nurture well enough. Get the idea? What would that be like for you to be judged not being a woman based on characteristics that the culture decides, oh, well, that's just, you're not going to be a woman. So that's an amazing and important issue for men and women is this testosterone thing impacts boys and men more than it does women and girls. And the whole hierarchy thing impacts men and boys in the world we live in. And then precarious manhood. Oh my gosh. You know, we hear so much from feminists about toxic masculinity. Ay, ay, ay. Toxic masculinity this, toxic masculinity that. But guess what? The whole research on precarious manhood pretty much negates the ideas about toxic masculinity. Because, you know, toxic masculinity says, oh, men, they're going to be too dominant. Yeah. And precarious manhood says, we expect men in this precarious manhood scenario to be dominant, to be more dominant. Hmm. Toxic masculinity says, we men, they're so competitive, they always have to win, 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 win. And the precarious manhood thing says, you know what? We expect men to be more competitive. That's kind of what they're in. That's the hierarchy they're in. They've got to be more competitive. And you could keep going. You know, the risk-taking and aggression is, oh, that's terrible. The toxic masculinity is risk-taking and aggression. Oh, my goodness. But precarious manhood says, you know what? You can expect men to be take more risks and to be more aggressive. Hmm. And status, all oh, these toxic men are status all the time. All they care about is status. Precarious manhood research says we can expect men to strive for status. So everything they say gets turned around on its head by this precarious manhood research. But the psychotherapeutic world doesn't really pay much attention to that, do they? Crazy stuff. And then the moral typecasting, you know, that's just one more piece of things. Or ladies, imagine what the world would be like if no one cared about your emotions. No one cared about your feelings. What would that be like? Hmm? You wouldn't like it so much. So, boys and men live in different worlds. We need to start appreciating that for what it is. Not shame them for not being more like women. Because the bottom line is we know that men are good. As are you. Like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Come see me on Patreon. Come see me on Regarding Men. We'll look forward to seeing you. Take care.